Well, welcome, everyone. Thanks for taking some time out of your Saturday morning to spend with us. It's a little gray and drizzly this morning. So how about a love story? Anyone interested in hearing a little bit of a love story? OK, so we'll start with that. He was a chocolate chip cookie, but I loved him. I met him at a party. There he was at the end of the buffet, a loner, the last one on the plate. He had a certain something, a sweetness, a sensuality. He was one hot cookie. I felt as if I've always known him, always hungered for him. When he looked at me with those warm brown eyes, I melted. Before I knew it, I had my hands on him, my mouth on him in public. After that night, we were inseparable. With him, I could be myself. He didn't seem to care what mood I was in, how I looked, even if I gained weight. Together, we had a recipe for happiness. No one satisfied me like Chip. <laughs> then things changed. My friend said he was no good for me. He started to give me heartburn. I felt crummy, and it had to end. Now we've gone our separate ways. I hardly think of him anymore. Oh, if I see a certain TV commercial, particular magazine ad, a coupon for 10% off, that old longing returns. And when we run into each other at the supermarket, we nod. We're friendly, but it's over. So we all maybe have our own stories about our relationship to food. Um, and there are many factors that actually influence our connection to food. Uh, today, what we'd like to do is introduce you to a few, a few topics that will hopefully help you understand your relationship to food, your relationship to your own mood, uh, just, just a little bit more. There's a whole host of information out there. We'll just introduce you to a few topics today. Uh, Dr. Rosen will talk about the connection between our mind and our body. Uh, Eliza will talk about uh, the role of nutrition and actually give you some tips for nutrition. And then I will introduce the concept of mindfulness. Uh, we'll do a little exercise. And this is all in the context of actually preparing for the holiday season as well, when our relationship to food actually gets quite, quite poignant. So um, with that, I will introduce Dr. Rosen. All right, good morning, everybody. Hi. Hi. So uh, as Dr. Hofsess mentioned, uh, this is a, a, a timely occurrence for this talk on food and mood uh, with uh, the holidays that most people celebrate right around the corner. So that's what we want to sort of lead in as a context for what we're talking about. And there are two sort of aspects of that. And they uh, heighten some of what we're talking about uh, in terms of, of this mind-body connection. So one is that uh, during the holidays, uh, there are many ways in which stress levels can increase. Uh, that can occur based on uh, going to different social functions and events. It can occur just on finding plans and finding something to do uh, for different holiday events. And it can occur based on uh, knowing that we're going to be with family, which as much as most of us might love family, <laughs> Can, uh, can bring certain things up. Uh, if you have uh, adult children, you may notice that they behave like they did uh, when they were 12 or 13 years old. And if you have parents that are still alive, you might notice that you behave like you are 12 or 13 years old. So you know, just things to, to keep in mind uh, for this sort of talk. So part of what we're, we're up to today is figuring out how we can begin to manage stress. And Eliza's talk specifically is going to focus a little bit on how we can use food uh, as medicine, how we can use food directly to, to impact our mood. And the other piece that goes along oftentimes with the holidays, as uh, the chocolate chip story uh, spoke to, is how many of us use food for comfort. Uh, and holidays are a time where most people uh, eat enough to need New Year's resolutions to eat less. Uh, so, you know, we're going to be talking, and Dr. Hopsess will address this other piece relevant to the holidays regarding how we can integrate a sort of mindfulness orientation into our lives uh, as it relates to food. 
So we're going to continue with this sort of theme of experiential learning this morning uh, with a, an eyes closed sort of exercise to begin to uh, highlight this supposed connection between our mind and our bodies, which this idea of food and mood uh, speaks to. So if you're up for it this morning, I'd invite you to uh, uncross your arms and your legs uh, sit in a, a dignified posture, whatever that might mean to you, and just allow your eyes to, to gently close if that's something that feels comfortable to you. If not, do whatever you need to do. So, we're just going to go on a journey uh, letting our mind lead us uh, through a few different situations. The first thing I'd like to invite you to do uh, is to imagine a perfectly ripe yellow lemon uh, in the palm of your hand. And just take a look at the lemon. Notice its texture. Notice its color. And then imagine uh, you have a cutting board and go ahead uh, with a, a knife that you have uh, and, and cut that lemon in half. And just imagine your cell phone rings at that moment. <laughs> and just come back to the lemon. And we'll let, the, we'll let voicemail just pick it up. And as you cut that lemon, you can now take this, this, uh, this wedge of lemon that you've cut into your hand and just bring it slowly closer to your lips. And not putting it in your mouth yet, but just imagine that you're holding it. And now allow your mouth slowly to, to take in that lemon and the juice coming into your lips and on your tongue. Just noticing any sensations in your mouth. Perhaps an increase of saliva in your mouth or not. Perhaps a little bit of a sourness or bitterness in your mouth or not. And then after you've had a chance to enjoy the lemon, go ahead and, and set it down. And we're going to go to, to part two of our visualization. Imagine now uh, that you are in the morning of a very important day where you need to get to a meeting. And this meeting is going to be incredibly important and you've decided on this particular day to take a bus to your meeting. And you're walking a little bit, you know, you're cutting it a little bit close on this particular morning uh, through no fault of your own. And you're, you, you see that up ahead this bus that you're taking is a little bit ahead of schedule, in fact, and it's pulling up to the stop when you're about a half block away. So just imagine running or walking briskly or as, as fast as you're able to move, however you move the most quickly, trying to get to this bus. Uh, this bus is your only real shot of getting to this meeting you need to be at on time. And you need to go a little bit faster and you're hearing that, those sounds of the brakes of the bus beginning to release and it's sort of taking off and you still have some hope that you're going to make this bus but it's moving and you've got to run pretty fast and it's continuing to move and you're waving your arms and you're shouting and you're hoping that the driver sees you but it doesn't look like she does. So run a little bit faster, you might be able to catch the bus but you didn't. And imagine what's, what that's like. And then just see how you're breathing right now and take a couple breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth and in through your nose and out through your mouth and just noticing you know the shift that may have occurred for you in those few seconds both when you were chasing the bus and now having taken just a few breaths in through your nose and out slowly gently through your mouth on our next stop, I'd like to invite you to go to your favorite vacation spot, whatever that might be, whether that's on a beach somewhere, or in the mountains, or in the woods somewhere. And just imagine what it's like to be at this perfect spot. Notice any sounds that you hear there. Notice any smells that you smell there. Notice any feelings on your body, maybe a cool breeze or sensation of water.
And now finally, on our last stop of this guided uh, visualization, I'd like to invite you to sit down at your perfect dinner table, whatever that table might look like. And I'd, I'd like you to invite in to that table any guests who you might want to enjoy a meal with. Just sort of take note as to who's around you. And then just quickly scan the table to see what favorite foods might appear. The sorts of things that if you could eat anything, if this could be the perfect meal that you could share with the perfect people, what sorts of things you might want on the table. And as you're getting ready to enjoy this feast with good company, just notice any sensations that are present, any emotions that come up for you around this glorious food and these wonderful people. And with the intention of bringing some of these good feelings with you the rest of the morning and the rest of the day, allow your eyes to, to gently open returning once again to the room. So this was meant just as a very brief exercise to experientially come into contact with the way in which our mind interfaces with our body. There's a way that simply by me saying some words, you begin to create a visual experience in your mind that, that, that then uh, begins to uh, bring forth certain emotions, certain sensations, even certain physiological reactions. And the idea that our mind and our bodies are connected, that we are not sort of split at the neck, is the, the foundation of the, the rest of our conversation this morning. So as an extreme sort of example of the mind-body connection, some of you may have heard the term pseudosiesis. And I'll just read you this brief account of a case description for anybody left unconvinced by our experiential exercise this morning. A 30-year-old woman waddles into a family clinic with a large belly and tender breasts. She says she can feel her baby moving inside of her. A doctor performs a pelvic exam and discovers that not only is there no baby, there's no uterus. Her medical records show she'd had a hysterectomy two years earlier. The idea of pseudosiesis or false pregnancy uh, is uh, sort of unpredictably common. The idea that women can actually generate a hormonal response that looks exactly uh, like pregnancy. You know, the, the, the tummy expands, you know, the, the breasts are tender, as, as is said in here. And it's, it's an example, perhaps an extreme example, but a real one that I've even seen, you know, in, in my time as a, a, you know, as a, in clinical training in hospital settings, that just demonstrates uh, this powerful connection the mind, and the mind has in, in, in relation to the body. Finally, a few statistics here. We know that up to 70% of primary care visits are for problems stemming from psychosocial issues. So seven out of 10 people who see a primary care physician are presenting with issues that aren't biological, but are issues that are, are psychosocial in nature. A study tracking 1,000 primary care patients found that 85% of complaints like IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, headaches, insomnia, pain, could not be traced to an organic etiology, meaning that uh, for eight and a half out of every 10 patients that come in to see a primary care physician, there wasn't any root cause that could be determined that was biological in origin. And finally, uh, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services documented that unhealthy lifestyles like smoking, poor diet, lack of exercise, substance use, risk behaviors are responsible for the vast majority of the top 10 causes of mortality. So although many of us are used to thinking about health in relationship to uh, just something going on uh, only in terms of uh, a physical manifestation in the body, a lot of what we're talking about actually goes through, or at least is related to, the way we interpret events, the way our mind makes sense of our external reality. 
So finally, I just wanted to draw attention to when we talk here at Bastyr about whole person healing, and when we talk about treating the whole person, what we're talking about is expanding a view of health to be inclusive not only of the mind and the body, which we're going to be highlighting today, but also, you know, these psychological components, social components and the environment around us, spiritual components, you know, more specifically in terms of psychological, the cognitive components and how we think about things, our emotional world, our culture, and the particular values that we hold in terms of what gives our lives meaning and purpose. So when we talk about healing the whole person and treating the whole person, we really want to take this more expanded view of the human being. And cumulatively, when we look uh, metaphorically you know, at, at, a, at a photo like this tree, we see that you know, the sum uh, is greater than, you know, than the individual parts. That, that collectively, we're talking about the uniquenesses, uh, the uniqueness, rather, that individual beings possess. Uh, so today we're going to be looking at a couple of these branches, uh, most specifically the biological component related to food and the psychological component related to how we engage with uh, food. So that's what we're up to today. I'd like to now uh, turn things over to our expert nutritionist, Eliza uh, Carlson, to, to lead us through what we need to know uh, from a nutritional perspective. Thank you. Dr. Rosen. All right, hello everyone. Hello. So now we get to talk about the food. Um, what you may have seen before is this very popular pyramid called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. And so this is something that I always take into account being a licensed mental health counselor as well as a nutritionist, is how am I going to help people with their spiritual and emotional needs if their physical needs aren't being met through their lifestyle of eating properly and taking care of their bodies. Um, so that's what I'm going to share with you today, is how you can take care of your body um, so that your moods, your hormones, your vitamin balance can be such that you can then attend to your emotional and spiritual needs. The relationship between food and mood. Go ahead and um, maybe bring them all up. What I'm going to talk about is five different parts. We're going to talk about amino acid balance and brain function, food sensitivities, blood sugar imbalances or hypoglycemia, Hypoglycemia is just a fancy name for low blood sugar. Vitamin and mineral deficiencies and hormone imbalance. So how do all of these five components come into play when we're looking at what foods you should eat for proper mood balance? So let's start off, oh, <laughs> there's six. Uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> altered body chemistry. So food, drug, and toxin ingestion definitely plays a role in how well you're gonna feel. So the physiology of emotions really starts with the neurotransmitters, and those are the chemicals that send messages in between the nerve synapses in our brain and in our nervous system. Um, what their role is in our body is to regulate our behavior. They're closely linked to our mood, and they're controlled by what we eat because they're made up of food components in our bodies. So the neurotransmitters that we'll talk about today are the ones that are most commonly associated with mood. Those are dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. So deficiencies, excesses, or imbalances can all cause changes in mood. So you can see it's very important to not only um, make sure you just have enough serotonin or enough dopamine or something, it's about the ratio and the balance of them. Um, and like I said, they carry the electrochemical impulses between our cells. So the building blocks of the neurotransmitters, here's where we get into foods, and if people want to take notes, I have lots of food ideas, so get out a pen. Um, serotonin is the chemical in our brain that makes us feel relaxed. So this is the one that is kind of the calming chemical. So the amino acid that it's made up is called, made up of is called tryptophan. Amino acids are found in proteins. So both sets of the neurotransmitters are made of amino acids. They're both found in proteins, but they're absorbed in a different way. So starting with serotonin, the proteins that it's most commonly found in are listed here. Turkey's the highest, so we're coming up on Thanksgiving. And um, everybody thinks, oh, you know, you eat that big meal of turkey, 
and you get all tired afterwards because your serotonin is up and it makes you feel so calm and comfortable. And that is the case to a certain extent. What most people aren't aware of is that the tryptophan must be eaten with a carbohydrate for absorption. So yes, you needed the turkey to help you feel all relaxed, but unless you ate the mashed potatoes and the pumpkin pie, you probably wouldn't fall asleep during the game. So, um, so here are some other sources that it's, that it's found in fish, soybeans, bananas, wheat germ, avocados, legumes is just another word for beans. So the dopamine and norepinephrine are also found in proteins. Now, there are proteins in very small amounts in some of these other foods listed here, like avocados, bananas, dairy, and some other sources here, pumpkins, fish, legumes again. So if you were to eat the turkey without the mashed potatoes, the dopamine and norepinephrine, those are the upper, the more feeling um, alert, um, focused, and attentive. These are the, the foods that will help you feel more alert and attentive when you're feeling down, whereas these are the foods, when combined with a protein, will help you feel more calm and at ease. So other considerations. To absorb your protein, you have to have proper digestion. So that's number one, proper digestion. Number two, in order to absorb the amino acids, there's a lot of other nutrition cofactors that come into play listed here. Now, before feeling like you need to go out and buy a separate vitamin for each one of these, the good news is, is that your fatty acid, all your B vitamins, some of your minerals here, if you're eating foods in their whole natural form, the tryptophan, the, you know, all of those amino acids are going to naturally come in a package that includes all of these. So all of those food sources that I just gave you, legumes, avocados, beans, turkey, fish, also contain these vitamins to help you absorb the protein properly. But let's talk a little bit about digestion. Food sensitivities are very common. And so, <laughs> um, and, and they really impede proper digestion of foods. They've been shown to be associated with depression, migraine headaches, behavior disturbances, etc. They can be caused by food molecules leaking through the gut into the bloodstream. So what happens is when people get really stressed out, um, either by emotional, physical, psychological stress, um, or emotional or psychological stress, or physical stress on the body of taking in toxins, um, having an injury, the lining of the gut can get thinner and not so great. And larger than are supposed to pass through, food particles can pass through, and your immune system will flag those and create a sensitivity to those foods. So it's very important that we take care of the lining of our gut by managing our stress properly. And I'm going to give you some food tips on what you can eat as well to take care of your gut. So the most common allergens that we see are wheat and gluten, dairy, corn, soy, citrus, nuts, eggs, and yeast. It's hard to tell what you might be sensitive to because you may have small little symptoms like headaches or stuffy nose or muscle aches or joint aches. And the best way to really figure it out is to just take those foods out for two to four weeks and introduce them back in one at a time and find out if, if you have symptom relief by taking them out, if the symptoms come back when you add the food back in a pretty clear indication that you probably have a sensitivity to that food. So during a, um, elimination of any food, generally supplementation is recommended. Um, it's good to go and do an elimination diet through a healthcare provider who can give you supplements to help heal your gut while you take out those allergens. What you can do naturally through foods is provide your foods with these, or to provide your gut with these foods, with these nutrients. Prebiotics, a lot of people have heard of probiotics now. It's fairly common that we've heard of that. That's what's in yogurt and um, like, do I have kombucha listed here? Kombucha's um, just come back. It's being more popular now. It's a fermented tea that's available. Probiotics are a wonderful, living, friendly bacteria that we need to have in our gut for proper digestion. Prebiotics 
are the food that the probiotics eat. Because this is a living bacteria, it needs food too. And so these, these prebiotics provide food for the probiotics. So there's another group of foods that's good to include in your diet there. Other helpful foods, some of the best nutrition for the gut actually comes from cabbage, garlic, and onions. If you're really having gut trouble and you can juice these, fantastic. Um, although eating the food in its whole form is generally the, the best way to get it. If you're really having digestive difficulties and all the fiber that's in the cabbage would cause upset, you can juice it. Herbs that are commonly recommended are listed here and supplements here. And I say this just with a word of caution. I'm not an herbalist. If you're not an herbalist, use always herbs with caution. There can be medication interactions and uh, significant side effects if you're not familiar with how to use them. Next. Okay, next on our list is hypoglycemia. And like I said, that's a word for low blood sugar. This happens, hypoglycemia is normal. It happens after you have digested all of your food. Two to eight hours after you eat, your blood sugar will drop. Your, your body has used up the energy from the food that it's taken in. If you don't provide more energy for your body in the form of more food, you might have some of these symptoms. Dizziness, confusion, headache, tiredness, difficulty speaking, difficulty concentrating, and irritability. I sometimes call this like the 3 p.m. sleepies or that lull that you get halfway through the afternoon. This is when people are least um, productive at work. So what happens most of the time is that you're going to get these more severe symptoms if your diet is higher in refined flours or sugars because those foods tend to go into your bloodstream the quickest, be used up, and then leave you just with nothing, just standing, you know, just without a, a slow form of fuel. So keeping foods higher in fat, protein, and fiber will keep give you more of a slow energy source and prevent that significant drop. Keep you going a little bit more steady. So how to avoid? Small frequent meals, so not waiting eight hours between meals. Um, adding protein, fiber, and a little fat to meals and snacks. Avoiding simple, processed, and concentrated carbohydrates. High fructose corn syrup, just say no. It's absorbed so quickly into our bodies. Our bodies don't know what to do with this highly processed food that it's really, it's really causing a problem um, for people with our insulin balance and pancreas and weight gain and all of this. Um, so lower glycemic, this just means um, don't affect blood sugar as much. Sweeteners are stevia, which is an herb. It's just an herb, herbal sweetener. It doesn't affect blood sugar much. It, it does a little, but not much at all. And agave nectar is a, a decent um, option as well, although it does affect blood sugar a bit more than stevia does. Whole grains, legumes, which is beans again, nuts and seeds, lean meats, eggs, fresh vegetables. I mean, here's basically, this should be the basis of, of everybody's diet, you know, mainly these foods with very little packaged or refined foods, and you're going to keep your blood sugar nice and level without that big drop in mood later in the afternoon. Okay, vitamins and minerals. So here's three classes of vitamins that are often um, associated with mood and behavior. We have our B vitamins that are focused on nerve conduction, metabolism, digestion, cell growth, and repair. I've got a lot of food sources here. Hopefully you can see it back there. Again, you see avocado keeps popping up, fish keeps popping up, um, whole grains I think have been in just about every list. So you can get your, your real powerhouse list of foods here and just hit everything at once. Your antioxidants are very important to pr protect from free radical damage. And we get free radical damage, well, just from being alive. The natural aging process will create free radicals in your body. But additionally, in the modern urban world that we live in, there's more free radical damage created from air pollution, um, pollution that comes off of building materials, off-gassing of plastics, um, food preservatives, 
chemicals that we um, take in and fertilizers in our foods, things like that. So it's incredibly, incredibly important to make sure you eat high antioxidant foods. The easy thing to remember is that brightly colored fruits and vegetables are high in antioxidants. You don't have to remember anything less than that. So we like to say eat the rainbow. The different antioxidant nutrients, A, C, E, selenium, flavonoids, CoQ10, and sulfur, all actually have color to them. And that's what gives the vegetables and fruits different colors, is their nutrient content. And so if you eat a variety of different colors, you're getting a variety of different nutrients and you're hitting all your bases. Magnesium is also important for nerve conduction. It's found in seeds, legumes, the dark leafy greens, soy products, <laughs> chocolate. Chocolate showed up on the, look, the good list, so breathe easy. 70% um, uh, cacao content or higher is generally considered a high enough um, cacao content to give you more of the benefits of the chocolate than maybe the downside of the high calories or the higher sugar content that is in certain chocolate bars. You can see also nuts are a wonderful um, source of magnesium. On that note, I should just mention there are some people that have chocolate cravings, <laughs> very specific to chocolate. You know, I don't care, like, I'm not interested in anything else, any kind of sweet, any kind of candy, I want chocolate. It has been said that that might be indicative of a need for more magnesium in your life. And if you want to try it, try eating some of those other things off the magnesium list. Um, I usually specifically say dark leafy greens because they have so many other um, cofactors in them as well as the magnesium that it can bring chocolate cravings down. Which or should we be eating to avoid the chocolate cravings? Dark leafy greens. Dark leafy greens. Yep. Oh, they're so much tastier than chocolate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, we'll talk about hormone balance real quick. So. With our hormones, we need fats. And the healthy fats are the omega-3 fatty acids. Um, the essential fats are three and six. So these are going to modulate neurotransmitters, again, the brain chemicals, and hormone production, as well as be anti-inflammatory in the body. The most important thing to remember is the ratio. Or maybe that you don't have to remember what the ratio is, but to remember that in a diet common to what we eat, we get a lot of nut and seed oils, soybean oil, canola, well, canola has some omega-3 in it, but um, some of those other oils are common in our diet and it brings up the omega-6. What we need to bring up for the proper ratio is the omega-3 generally. The good sources of omega-3 are fatty fish. I've got a whole list here, salmon, local for us, mackerel, halibut, trout, Sardines are good. Um, on a veg for a vegetarian source of omega-3, flax seeds and flax oil, walnuts and walnut oil and canola oil all have omega-3 in them. Finally, we'll just talk just a minute about altered body chemistry. So this is the exposure and ingestion of toxins, and I've already mentioned this a little bit. Sources that um, people are most commonly exposed to come in the foods that we eat, unfortunately, in the form of colorings, preservatives, and additives. Caffeine does <laughs> is considered a toxin to the body if, if exposed in too much. Now, generally, one to two cups of coffee a day are okay for most people. Some people, that's going to be too much. Um, don't forget there's other sources of caffeine that can sneak in that people might not be aware of. Alcohol especially prevalent around the holiday season. Um, it affects our sleep cycle, which affects overall health and immunity. And it also causes hypoglycemia, which we talked about a little bit before. So it's strongly connected with mood, just in how it um, affects how we digest our foods. This is why you get the munchies later on after drinking, even if you ate a big meal, um, because it, it disrupts how the liver can put glucose into the blood and nicotine as well. It changes appetite and triggers the fight or flight response, which is the sympathetic nervous system thinking that it's in a stressed mode. And we don't need to be more stressed. <laughs> so let's go on to our beautiful and amazing liver. I had to have a little, just a little snippet on this because 
our liver has more than 50 functions in our body. It's amazing. It is the only organ that will regenerate itself. You can lop off a piece of it and like a starfish, it will grow back. I mean, our body need, knows how important it is. Um, here's a couple of the functions listed here that are relevant to our discussion today. Here's the, like, the big, exciting, the lamb! No. It detoxifies, it regulates blood sugar, um, and properly metabolizes nutrients. So pay attention to these liver cleansing foods. Keep these in your diet all the time, just to keep you balanced away from the, you know, exposure, like I said, to pollutants in the air, to the foods that we eat, to the stress that you're under. Keep your liver healthy. So here's a whole list. Garlic and onions showing up again. Remember, they were good for your gut. Broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, also good for the gut. Brussels sprouts, beets, carrots, artichokes, lemons, parsnips, dandelion greens, watercress, burdock root. A lot of these are in season right now. So you can have, you know, we've got our beets and carrots and parsnips and burdock root, all this stuff um, is very fresh. You can find it locally grown right now and would be a wonderful addition to your holiday fair to keep you going strong. So where to start? Make dietary changes one step at a time, little by little. Don't try to jump in and do it all. Combine your proteins with complex carbohydrates for the ultimate um, effect of alertness and calm. Remember we had the two, the dopamine brings you up, the serotonin brings you down, so you want to have complex carbohydrates along with protein. You'll be up from the protein and you'll have the calm from the carbohydrate. Talk to your nutritionist about creating a meal plan that works for you and um, eating a balanced diet will reduce cravings while, pr um, while providing your diet with the building blocks for the neurotransmitters in the brain and help regulate your hormones. I think that's now to Dr. Hofsess. Great. Thanks for the wonderful chock full of information from Eliza. And I'm going to talk a little bit now. You've got some tips about what to eat. So we're going to talk a little bit about the how of eating and actually our relationship to food. Um, I want to read a poem by Rumi, who is a 16th century Sufi poet called The Guest House. And this is a poem that I think is a, a, captures the essence of mindfulness, which we'll be talking about in the next 15, 20 minutes. This human being is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house, empty of its furniture. Still treat each guest honorably. He may be cleaning you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from the beyond. So I'm going to talk a little bit about mindfulness, but I wanted to start with what mindfulness is not. As I read this list, I'd like you to think about the last time you maybe experienced one of these things, and maybe in the last two hours or the last day. When we are not mindful, we are rushing. Got to get here, got to get there, got to go. We're absent-minded. Oh, where did I replace my keys? Overreacting to thoughts and experiences not being fully aware of everyday activities. We're kind of brushing our teeth. Did I brush my teeth? Did I, you know, did I make that phone call? This, this, this experience of kind of being on automatic pilot. We're worrying about the future. Oh my gosh, when am I going to get the groceries? When am I going to get the ticket to go home? When am I going to get the, the, the holiday gifts? Focusing on the past. Oh, last holiday season was just a disaster. You know, <laughs> worrying about the future, focusing on the past, judging our experiences. I shouldn't be thinking about this. I shouldn't want to do this. Wanting more. Oh, I want, you know, I'm in a store. I want more. I want more chocolate. I want more gifts. Clinging or grasping or avoiding unpleasant thoughts or sensations or experiences. Ah, I, you know, I don't want to feel this discomfort. I don't want to feel this anxiety. Um, and just generally being out of touch with our body. How many of you have had one of these experiences in the last 24 hours? Okay. So most of us go through life, you know, 
in this experience of, of, of mindlessness. When we take that, that quality of being and we sit down and we eat, that impacts actually our experience of uh, our, our eating experience. When we are thinking about or distracted, we actually make decisions about food that are not based on our internal cues for fullness or satiety. So we often make decisions about the food we eat based on many other reasons than how they taste and how hungry we are. Most people don't overeat because we're hungry. We overeat because of family. Oh, grandma says, just have another piece of pie. Just have you know another, another helping of mashed potatoes. Friends, oh, are you sure you're gonna have that other cookie? Or here, just take another drink. Packages, oh, this, this salad dressing looks pretty cool because it has a famous person on it. I'm gonna buy it. Plates, names, numbers, labels, colors, shapes and smells, distractions and distances a whole host of external factors, lots of stimuli that impact the decisions we make about the food we eat that are not related to actually uh, how hungry we are or how, how full we are. What's the impact of actually eating in this state? Um, well, we lose our ability over time to detect our, our cues for satiety or fullness or our cues for hunger. When we're responding to stimuli, external cues, we're paying more attention to what's around us than what's inside us. We don't know when we're full or when we're hungry. Dieting and suppressing hunger actually can contribute to that cycle. We're, because we're not listening to our bodies, we're not responding to our cues for hunger or fullness. When we eat uh, from this state of kind of mindlessness, automatic pilot, rushing, um, we actually might overeat and so we can gain weight. So weight gain might be an impact. You know, there is an op obesity epidemic in the US today, over two thirds of Americans are overweight or obese. Another factor that, uh, that is impacted by this eating from this state of, of uh, automatic pilot is we actually have more nutrients as, nutrients that aren't good for us and less that are good. Um, and that is because we often have a tendency to rely on foods of convenience. You know, if we're, 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 we're rushing to get to this place, we grab the, the, you know, the box of Cheetos, we stop at the fast food, we, we eat foods actually that are probably not on the list that Eliza just went over. Um, we also then have more digestive distress, gas or bloating. When we eat in a state of anxiety or stress, um, there's actually four times less blood flow to the stomach when we're eating in a state of anxiety and distress, and that can contribute to, to gas and bloating. There's a direct impact on our physical body. Um, so you might recognize this, this pattern through the holidays, rushing, freneticism, kind of automatic pilot. That contributes to stress hormones. Our cortisol goes up. When that cortisol goes up, our, digested, our digestion system kind of slows down. Um, we're not absorbing our nutrients as, as well. And then we're not able to actually tell when we're full. So we might overeat. So you can see the cyclical pattern um, that happens 365 days of the year, but also uh, most generally over the holidays. So, so how can we break that? Well, Eliza has given some tips about foods, but we can also maybe break that cycle through how we relate to our experience um, of eating. And uh, the concept of mindfulness is one that we're gonna talk more about and actually have an experience of. So how many of you are, have heard of mindfulness or familiar with the concept? This is actually not any, anything new. It's been around for thousands and thousands of years. The Eastern philosophies and religions have talked about mindfulness. It's only been popularized in Western medicine more recently. And actually, the effects of incorporating mindfulness uh, have, there's much more research right now that is actually demonstrating the positive effect of mindfulness on mental health conditions and physical health conditions. Uh, John Kabat-Zinn, who's at the University of Massachusetts, started a, the st mindfulness-based stress reduction clinic. And um, so I want to talk about his definition of mindfulness to get us all on the same page of what, we, what we're talking about when we talk about mindfulness. He talks about paying attention on purpose in a particular way. 
Okay, so mindfulness is paying attention. What are we paying attention to? We're paying attention to our moment-to-moment -moment experience. We're paying attention to what's happening in this moment. I'm noticing I'm actually walking forward. I have a little bit of a headache. I'm a little bit hungry. I'm saying my words. You know, I have a little tension in my neck. I'm paying attention to what's happening on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. And that can include my thoughts, my feelings, my body sensations. Paying attention to my moment-to-moment -moment experience on purpose, on purpose, with intention, meaning I, uh, I bring intention to my experience. I kind of step out of automatic pilot. When I'm an automatic pilot, I'm actually not paying attention to what's happening to me on a moment to moment basis. I'm thinking about what I need to do, what I forgot to do, everything else except what maybe is happening to me in the moment. So the quality of intention is really important. I'm bringing intention to my moment to moment experience. And in a particular way, with an attitude, bringing an attitude uh, of, it's, it's the how of how you pay attention. There's many different qualities uh, that you can cultivate kind of a mindfulness attitude. It's bringing an attitude of acceptance, non-judgment, patience, um, non-striving, gentleness, kind of cultivating this attitude uh, that we, that allows us to experience our, uh, ourselves on a moment-to-moment -moment basis with, with, with some <coughs> gentleness, with non-judgment, okay? So it's cultivating that attitude as we pay attention to what's happening to us on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. When, when we do that and, and we characterize that state within ourselves and we bring that to, to our eating experience, it looks very different um, than the definition of mindless eating. Eating mindfully means eating with awareness of the food you have on your plate. plate. Mm -hmm. And the experience of eating each bite. It includes your eating environment. It is being present moment by moment with each sensation that happens during eating, such as the chewing, the tasting, the swallowing, as well as noting temperature, texture, and seasoning. Okay. What are some of the benefits of eating this way? Uh, I'm sure you might even begin to think of those. Um, and we'll actually go, th go through a, an experience together uh, of, of mindful eating. But um, some of the benefits of eating that way is actually we become more attuned to our internal cues for hunger and satiety. We actually then say, oh, am I hungry? Do I really want to, to eat more? If I do, I'll have more. Geez, I might be more full. When we pay attention to our own physiological response, you know, it, it is more likely for us to manage our weight. We're not overeating as much because we're paying attention. We actually might have um, a kind of a brighter, brighter mood and more energy. If you've ever uh, had a meal where you've just eaten enough, you know, and you walk away from the table, can you think of the time you've done that and you've actually had a little more energy than when you overeat and you feel a little sluggish? When you eat just enough, you usually have a little bit more energy uh, to take to your next task. And when we do this, we actually, over, over and over, we begin to actually feel good that we can make choices about the foods that we eat. Self-efficacy is knowing that we can make good choices about the food. So when we pay attention to our eating experience, we can kind of enhance our self-efficacy about, about making decisions around food. We also, a benefit of mindful eating, is we just have a general increased awareness of our thoughts and feelings around our eating experience. So when I go to the refrigerator at 10 o'clock at night and I open, I'm looking at the Trader Joe's mint chocolate chip ice cream cookies, and I grab one, I can ask myself, geez, am I, you know, maybe I'm tired. If I'm tired, I should go close it or go to bed. Maybe I'm bored. Unlikely, but maybe I'm, maybe I'm lonely. So I shut the door and I call a friend. Right? It, when we're paying more attention to our thoughts, our body, our feelings, we may become more in tune to what we need and we can fulfill those needs um, ra rather than relying on food. And sometimes, you know, you just take the chocolate chip cookie and eat it because it tastes good. 
finally, if you're not going <laughs> to, yeah, the, the ink, eating mindfully actually can contribute to the experience of just have, enjoying food and, 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 and having a pleasurable experience. So if you're not going to do it for any of these, you know, the quality of like having the mango and really just enjoying like the stickiness of it and enjoying the taste is when we eat food and we feel good, we actually induce a relaxation response in our body. When we eat from a relaxed state, our digestion improves, we absorb more nutrients. So there's actually benefit to eating from a state of pleasure, you know, eating to feel good because our bodies are more relaxed, okay? So mindfulness is really about transforming our relationship to our experiences, right? You know, all this stuff is happening, but we, we might relate to it very differently. So let's, let's do, we're going to do it actually an exercise. Um, I think everyone has uh, some, some raisins. Um, if you could take two right now. So I've been talking a lot. Um, and mindfulness is, is less uh, something, an intellectual experience, and more actually a real experience. It's something to have. So, so we're going to, I invite you to join me um, in this exercise. So take one raisin and just pop it in your mouth and eat it as you would any raisin. I don't think I've ever eaten this many raisins with anyone in <laughs> one group. We're all enjoying one raisin right now. OK. I swallow that. Now I'm going to lead you through a mindful exercise as we eat, as we eat the second raisin. So if you take the second raisin, put it in your hand, and just begin to look at this raisin. Just drink it in through the eyes. Just notice the color, the shape, the texture. Imagine that this shriveled up little thing was one that looks kind of like a belly button was once something of a greater whole. Look at this raisin as if you've never even seen a raisin before. You've certainly never seen this one. Just begin to take in what this raisin looks like, the ridges, the shapes, the size. Now actually bring it up to your nose. I want you to, to drink in the aroma. See if you can smell what this raisin smells like. I smell just a faint raisin-like smell. Okay. Like lavender hand lotion. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, just notice whatever smells you come from your hand in this raisin right now. Yeah. Okay, now bring it down and close your eyes actually and, and begin to just put the raisin in between your fingers, kind of play with it in your hand. I put it between my fingers and it, it feels a little sticky. You know, and play with that. What does it feel like, this one raisin? You know, kind of push it back in the palm of your hand and just feel the heft of it, the weight of it. What does this raisin feel like in your hand? And now bring it to your ear. Okay, we don't usually hear food, except maybe when it sizzles. I don't know. Notice if you hear anything. Okay, now bring it down. You want to open your eyes and actually place the raisin between your two fingers and now bring it to your mouth. Just notice, bring it to your mouth and actually just honor this movement that w the hand and the, the mouth. When we were six months old, we couldn't do that. Food went everywhere. Now, you know, our bodies actually uh, have this real mind-body connection. We can, we have voluntary control. So notice now what happens as you place the raisin to your lips. Just notice, I, I, I st am starting to salivate. The enzymes are secreting in my mouth in anticipation of, of feeding. You know, this is a real mind-body phenomenon. Okay, now just gently place the raisin in your mouth. Don't take any bites. No, just place it in your mouth. And pay attention to what happens in your mouth as the raisin is on your tongue and in your cheeks. Notice what, it, what, what tastes come up for you, how it feels, kind of the intelligence of the, the tongue and the cheek and the brain with this one raisin in your mouth, noticing the textures and really paying attention to the direct experience of this raisin in your mouth. 
you know, without any thoughts of what it is, the, the, the sensory experience of tasting the raisin, feeling it in your mouth, and, and this, of this very familiar experience of eating that we often do with not much awareness. Notice what's happening in your mouth right now. And now I'd like you to take three or four deliberate, slow chews on the raisin. And, and notice what changes in your mouth as you chew the raisin. What happens in the experience of your mouth to the raisin as you start to chew. Paying attention to the, to the feeling, the tasting, the, the hearing of this one raisin that's now in your mouth. And pay attention to your first impulse to swallow, to swallow this raisin, okay, without swallowing. Noticing what's happened. This, and now you can take a couple deliberate swallows and in your mind's eye, you can imagine actually now this raisin going down your digestive tract into your belly with the awareness that you've just eaten and swallowed one raisin. Resting in that awareness right now uh, of what it was like to the thinking and the feeling and the tasting and the experiencing of one, one raisin. Mindfulness is, is the kind of awareness of that which is unfolding as it is occurring. Okay, so um, I'd it, like you to just maybe take 30 seconds and tell a person next to you what the difference was like for you between eating that first raisin and the second raisin. You know, a couple words that described your experience. <laughs> We're over time. Yeah. yeah. I know. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. I was uh, in the middle of a sentence oh. with. Uh, Last time you had me say something about like cutting shoes and way to go, so just to bring it back to Okay. Yeah, I will do that. Is this the last slide? Yeah, this is the last slide. Okay. Okay. So, um, we had time, I'd love to hear everyone's experience of that. And obviously, you know, we um, can't bring that level of awareness to every bite that we eat on every meal or it would, that's all we would be doing. But, but we do invite you to actually maybe start each meal, you know, the first bite of every meal with this quality of mindfulness. Experiment with the ways you could introduce this in your own life. Um, so we invite you to explore mindfulness as a strategy uh, for getting more in touch with yourself and your relation, shifting your relationship to food and actually as a, as a strategy for stress management over the holidays. Wanted to just reinforce a couple tips for the holidays um, as they're approaching and then we'll wrap up for today. Um, so focus on what's most important to you. So remember, um, you know, to focus on the people and even not the food. You know, what's most important to you over the holidays? What are your, what, what, what values do you have? What rituals are important to you? Focusing on what's most important to you, focusing on the people, the experiences, you know, and not the food. Um, cultivating a positive attitude, keeping in perspective when things come up. Is this big, small, um, medium stressor? And uh, cultivating an attitude of, of of openness and resilience can actually make you, it easier to, to have any minor stressors and setbacks during the holidays. Identify those stressors that you have. If stress is related to money management, time management, family, kind of be proactive and figure out what exactly are your stressors over the holidays and take some steps to kind of think about a plan that you could enact that would help you manage those stressors. Uh, plan for triggers, if, you know, and this is if you're at a holiday party, you're going to a party and you know, you know, you have a tendency to eat or drink too much, you know, pay attention at the beginning and kind of plan. I'm only going to have two helpings or two drinks. You know, I know that being at this party might trigger this automatic pilot. So I, sometimes that intention can actually help. Finally, 
sleep, exercise, and manage time. These are basic stress management strategies. Get your sleep, um, uh, exercise, and find ways to manage your time. These are you know, stress management that strategies that actually help regardless of the, the season of the, of the season, the holiday season. And slow down, breathe, and enjoy. Slow down, take a breath eat a, a, a raisin mindfully and just enjoy you know the experience of the holiday when you're relaxed you're more likely to you know um, enjoy and 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 laugh so um, those are some tips yeah um, I think we wanted to just um, thank you for coming and spending this hour with us this morning wanted to let you know of a couple resources here at the clinic um, we actually have an, a weight management program that we will be running two programs starting in January. So we offer a weight management program called way to go and it's a nine week weight management program uh, where you at uh, 30 minutes uh, every week uh, with of, of an individual counseling session and a, and a one hour group experience. So we're now actually registering people for our, our group that starts in January. Um, and if you're interested, there's some flyers at the back of the, um, I think back in the table, it looks like this, way to go. Um, and um, the students who are in the Masters in Nutrition and Clinical Health Psychology program actually are the counselors. We combine principles of whole food nutrition with the principles of health behavior change. And that's what really underlies this, this unique individual and group program. We also have counseling shifts that are available at the clinic. Um, and if you are experiencing, would like support for stress or depression or anxiety, we do have uh, counseling shifts that are, that are run by students who are naturopathic students and clinical health psychology students and supervised by licensed psychologists. So we just wanted to let you know some of the resources available at the clinic. And as always, we also have nutrition shifts as well. So um, we are available for some questions. Um, you know, we've kind of gone over today, so we thank you for, for sitting with us um, this morning. Uh, and uh, thank you. Okay.